Hey guys, it's Vince. Today in this video, we're gonna be discussing spindle cable fabrication. I am getting more and more inundated with questions on assembling spindle cables for all different multitudes of spindles out there. And realistically, I wanted to just give you guys an overview of what to expect when working with double shielded cable, which all of you, of course, should be using for a spindle application, and dealing with that and also put you on the right path of what to expect as far as the fabrication process. Um, I'm gonna say this before I even start this. Uh, of course, I can't assemble a spindle cable and shoot and do all this at the same time. First of all, it's just way too time consuming. And honestly, if I cover the basic details, most of you out there already realize that when you're assembling your own CNC robot, you're going to have to be comfortable soldering, working with heavy duty cables, and understand the principles of what goes into fabricating something like this. It is electrical. It is electrical in the sense that it can definitely be fatal if you don't know what you're doing. So keep that in mind. You know, if you don't know what you're doing, if you're not comfortable with soldering, of course, use common sense, contact me, contact someone else, and see if they can do it for you so that, of course, you're not taking uh, a high risk, so to speak, with your life or in your family. So just, again, let's start from the ground up and understand what we're working with. First and foremost, uh, the spindle cable you'll be working with on 98% of the applications that are out there are, is a 16-4 double shielded cable. Now, many of you realize once you get this cable, this is no joke. I've said this in previous videos. This cable is definitely uh, an industrial rated cable. Um, you're dealing with 16 gauge leads. The insulation on this cable is 600 volt. Um, again, it is made for industrial use. That being said, we have to take into account the equipment that it's going to take to assemble this cable. Okay, many of you out there, and I'm just going to start with you know what we're working with as far as a generic spindle. Again, most of you, I'll say I'll say it that way because again, I mean I am getting a lot more questions on um, different size spindles. Most of you are going to be familiar with this four-pin connector that comes with most spindles. Okay, now this four-pin connector unscrews. You can see how this works. It's an aviation connector. It unscrews, and you're going to have four actual terminals. It's an aviation plug. You'll have four terminals, real basic, and, of course, the housing. Okay, and, and something to point out immediately is this cable does not easily fit into this housing. Okay, that being said, we as CNC enthusiasts slash professionals have to understand that in order to use this cable, you have to open up this housing. First, you would grind down. Now, now, my preferred tool of choice is an actual rotary file for a Dremel. Real simple. Most of you guys out there all should have a Dremel. Um, you're going to take that. You're going to actually use the rotary file on the bottom portion of the actual cable's connector. And you're also going to use, over here on the top, you're going to use and bevel that out and open this up. And the cable will fit perfect. Okay, This is a must. The Chinese do not anticipate you using this type of cable. Okay, when we talk about overbuilding, this is the type of cable that you want to overbuild with, a double shielded cable. It's going to have a lot thicker diameter than standard cable in a 16 gauge format because again, we're dealing with mylar foil and we're dealing with timbrated copper. This is the correct cable to use in any spindle application. Let me say that again, it is the correct cable to use for any spindle application for your CNC robot. If you're using a 48 volt spindle, some of you are. Um, for the smaller gray machines, you should be using an 18-4 double shielded cable. Any spindle for your CNC double shielded cable is the mandatory choice. Now, as far as plasma guys, I get guys out there, even though they're not talking about spindles, anybody dealing with a plasma system, double shielded cable is a must. It's a must. You're dealing with too much electromagnetic interference, EMI, okay, noise, electrical noise. I've discussed it numerous times. It's mandatory to use the right cables. And believe me, you don't appreciate having the right cables until you've gone through the hell of not having them, okay? Take that into account. Think about your budget. Don't build the system half-ass and wonder why you've got a system that's not stable. Okay? The realism is you're totally responsible for your system. Own it and understand that if you cut corners in certain areas and the cables are, the, are literally the cardiovascular system, so to speak, of your actual robot. There's no other way to put it than that. Okay? If, if you have shoddy cables, cheap cables, unshielded cables, you're not choosing the proper cable, your signals get corrupted, the machine is all over the place. You're going to have all kinds of issues. So again, keep that in mind. 
As you see here, once again, once this cable connector is actually modified, your cable will slip right through this, okay? Uh, and again, this is based on this typical connector. If your connector is different, the process is exactly the same on the actual connector's housing. Uh, you want to make sure that you naturally have clearance. That's, the, that's where the Dremel comes in. It's going to be your best friend. Okay, you'll open this up and it'll come out wonderful if you take your time. Uh, many of you are very meticulous and I guarantee you'll be very happy with the result. Now, one of the things that always comes up, and I've seen a lot of videos on this, okay, Aviation connectors, when you're actually soldering an aviation connector, the proper way to work with an aviation connector, I see guys holding these things with all kinds of things from these helping hands, which are BS, I mean, they're little alligator clips and this and that. Let's think about what we're dealing with, okay? We're dealing with a connector. It's basically a nylon type material, high temperature. And what I like to use is a vise, okay? I'll use a vise, a soft gel vise. And what I like to do is, is once again because I've been burned many times and literally quite <laughs> figuratively and literally speaking um, when dealing with soldering but one of the things I like to do is always analyze the connector I'm working with if you are out there and you're not used to soldering these type of connectors the first thing you want to do is look at where the connectors are placed I know that sounds basic once you analyze where the connectors are placed you're gonna look and figure out okay they're numbered you can see that they're numbered one two three four four is always going to be your ground a spindle connector is real basic guys and why I tell you that is regardless of the color of the leads of the cable you're working with you can hook up the power leads in any typical configuration you like on one two and three of the pins because you know fourth pin is going to be ground and the remaining three are going to be for a three phase spindle typically so that means they're going to be supplying power on all three of these pins so regardless if you choose red white or black you can allocate it any way you'd like because they're all power leads okay so don't make don't overshoot the runway and think I have a lot of guys that are like oh man I gotta do this I gotta do that the main thing is is that you connect the cable correctly and that means using solder and flux once again the cable must be connected correctly using solder and flux I still get questions on that understand how to use those actual tools because that's exactly what they are and that's mandatory to give you a professional finish and also the proper bond you want to make sure that that solder is not only um, adhering but it's properly bonded in the sense that 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 flux is actually cleaning these terminals for the proper connection that's what we want okay so once again we've already covered the terminal placement it's basically irrelevant pins one two and three can be any color lead other than green which green will always be ground okay and ground will always go to pin four okay now when we're dealing with double shielded cable or shielded cable you're gonna have a drain okay I get asked all the time which end of the cable should I put the ground drain well that's up to you okay it's your system it'll work effectively on either end I prefer the VFD end that's that's what I prefer and a matter of fact I'm gonna show you a cable actually one of the two that I just built for a client so you guys will see exactly how I did it um, and again it'll give you a, a point of reference to use as you assemble your own now what I was saying about the actual terminal placement is now that you've studied these and you realize okay this is going to be kind of tricky because I have an over under placement on these actual terminals it's going to be awkward to work with know that right away okay I have practiced for years to understand these connectors and one of the things I've learned that works the best once again is a vise to stabilize the unit and hold it properly and once you use a soft gel vise you will utilize a pencil type adequate sized uh, soldering iron okay I recommend a weller if you don't have a high budget a weller will work perfectly um, and get yourself one from Lowe's or Home Depot again not rocket science it needs to be adequate in producing the right amount of heat to get the proper bond okay now I personally like to start from the bottom and work my way up and the main reason I say that is because if you start from the bottom and work your way up you don't have leads in your way when you go to solder it does help to be ambidextrous because you're going to find unless you're going to be rotating this and working with heavy cable that's not the easiest thing to do most guys find that out once they purchase it and then say oh my god I've never worked with this before this is totally different than you know an RC wire or something for stereos or whatever they've dealt with with electronic based units so keep that in mind you're dealing with an industrial cable guys this is no joke I mean and I I've chose this cable for a reason it's excellent it's extremely heavy duty and for this application it's dead nuts on 
So what we want to do is again analyze the situation. I like starting once again with the two bottom leads and then I work my way up. Okay, much easier that way. I think you'll find it easier that way as well. Now you can rotate the leads to actually encompass that on that angle if you needed to. Okay, and if you rotate the leads, you'll find that sometimes when you rotate the leads, it's easier to acclimate where you're going to solder to because you'll find that those leads are going to be in a different position in the sense of where they're held in the vise. So again, you have to play with this. However, I typically find that just keeping them centered, dropping the wires in, and being that these wires, if you look at this cable correctly, from, the, from um, looking at it just straight on, you'll see where your ground is. If you rotate this cable over, it'll basically just fit right into the correlation of, where, of the, the number pin correlation on the connector. So you really don't have to do too much. What you do have to do is figure out how you're going to skin the leads, cut everything, make it neat. Again, I recommend using heat shrink. Um, I like to use a heat shrink piece around these terminals once I'm done. And basically what I mean by that, let me just show you, give you a little quick example, is I'll cut this. Now this is too long, but I cut that and typically go over there and this way you're insulated. This way when you shrink it, you do not have to worry about this metal housing ever making possible contact with the unit. Now if you don't want to do that, you can also use liquid silicone. Okay, Guys that are in a high moisture environment, if you're keeping your system outside, um, if you're fabricating uh, cables for a plasma system where you're going to be, you know, dealing with water and whatnot, I recommend using silicone because it's going to be a moisture seal barrier on your connectors. Okay, That's the difference from professional to novice, is always building towards your application. That's, again, that's number one key rule in, in engineering is you build towards the application. Don't negate the details. The details bite your ass. And I'm telling you now at CNC, the guys that have actually went through and subscribed to my channel and have, have actually reviewed my videos for a while, they realize more and more what I'm saying is true. Unfortunately, they find out it's true because what I'm saying, they're like, oh, I remember it. my system is doing that. Unfortunately, that's not the way I want you guys to learn. I want you to learn understanding don't cut corners, take the time and cover the details. Okay? But you can see here, the connector is nothing special. And again, this is what we're working with, okay? This cable, again, is, is flexible, but let's be real. It is a cable, okay? It is 16-4. You have four leads in there. Not only do you have four leads, you also have twine in between the leads. I get asked questions about that. Why is there twine in between the leads? Well, when this cable flexes inside your cable chain, most of you are using, you don't want the leads to be rubbing on each other because over time, the casing of the leads will begin to fray. So we want them to stay nice and solid and again, be as durable as they can be. This is why this cable was made to my application for that because I know exactly what they use in full scale industry and this is what they use. It is not cheap. I get asked that all the time, you know. Um, these cables are not cheap. Most of you guys go in the store. Uh, my price is cheap for what you're getting, but these are not cheap. Double shielded cables are not cheap and they're not cheap for a reason. If they're made right, they will totally change a system's performance once again depending how they're assembled. So now what I'm going to do, I've given you guys basically a good forefront on what we're dealing with. Now keep in mind, one other key point I want to point out here is once this is actually installed on the cable down here and the piece of heat shrink, again you always have to go in sequence, so once this is installed, okay, this will be down here so to speak, then you need your piece of heat shrink and that's going to come on here. So you're going to have all this stuff sitting down here so that when you're all done, your connector will come in. And remember, these connectors screw in, guys. You can see this has to screw on. So you want to make sure that when you open this unit up that you deburr everything, okay? The metal casing has to be open. It has to be deburred so you're not scratching the piss out of your, your casing on your cable. And then you just rotate this end. You do not rotate this end. You want to come over here and just screw this like this. We want to go over here and just screw the base. Actually, I think I confused you. I said rotate this. No, you want to rotate this until where it locks. That's what we're trying to do. Because once the cable's leads are actually connected here, you will not be able to spin the cable so easily. Now, I prefer this way. I've had some clients tell me that they can hold the cable and if they hold it just right, they can rotate this. I still prefer this way. The actual uh, casing of the actual terminals works really well, this outer middle casing. So again, just keep in mind what we're working with. 
if you follow that process you're going to be good always take into account where you're going to cut your casing off because you are going to have an engagement of your actual stress relief okay your, your stress relief has to come in here and make contact with the outer casing because when you tighten this down you want to make sure that it's engaging the casing properly okay a lot of guys go man i need to cut these leads i need to cut the casing so short to actually engage this to where you know then you have heat shrink sticking out this that and the other thing and that's correct you can use heat shrink you can use double heat shrink i get asked that question a lot don't be afraid of putting two pieces of heat shrink on it's cheap okay and it's going to protect you and it's going to make the cable more durable take your time okay i i try to work with electrical under one aspect when i'm selling professional type components i take into account that i have no idea who i'm selling to and i like to pretend that if i screw up their life is at stake if you always do that and build to that type of quality perspective when you're assembling your own equipment you're always going to be right where you should be think in that terms if you're thinking life or death your whole mentality changes okay because again the performance of your system is great but i want to make sure you're safe that's the big thing because safety i think is never really discussed with cnc too often not until uh, an accident happens but realistically not only does being safe not cost you as much money in the hospital god forbid and also in your shop but it's just the right thing to do guys so just keep that in mind once again when we come over here we install this unit you definitely want to make sure that your stress relief is adequate adequately excuse me secured around the casing of the actual cables if you if you remove more of the casing the outer pvc casing make sure you use at least two pieces of heat shrink because the extra heat shrink will act as a binder to hold your cables together and not allow chafing. Okay, that's what we're trying to do. Okay, so I hope this has been clear. Now what I'm going to do is I'll show you a real quick cable. Actually, I built two of these for a client. And I'll show you what I did. Okay, this is the cable. And you can see here what I did. Now this client is in a very high moisture situation. So after I assembled the cable, I actually used some of my Ed 704 silicone and I sealed it. You can see how I sealed inside there, along with the heat shrink done on this end of the terminal. So like I showed you uh, uh, with the terminals here, let me just say, show you again, so we're all on the same page. So with this heat shrink installed, you'll cut it to the length you need, and that shrunk inside there. Now I sealed this with silicone, so that's nicely sealed. You can see how our fit is right here, as far as our stress relief. And you can also see I used a nice piece of heat shrink over. And why I did that, there's really no connection here as far as this is all solid. But it keeps this super solid where he's actually connecting this to his uh, uh, spindle. Okay, so it's going to make this more rigid, which is what we want. And then this way, you know you've got a durable as hell connector. And this came out beautiful. This is exactly what you want to have when you're done. Okay, now whether or not you use the silicone, that's totally up to you. Once again, I'm building towards applicational use. Okay, I know the client, I know what he wants, and I know what he paid for this. Okay, the other end of the cable, because I get asked about this, and I told you guys I like to put my lead for my shield, for my grounding, on the opposite end. Now, due to the fact this is double shielded cable, you will soon realize that you're dealing with tin braided copper and mylar foil. There is no ground drain. So when I say that, you make it with the tin braided copper. You'll roll it up into a wire, which I did here, and then I use silicone, and I love silicone wire for applications. First of all, it's very uh, heat resistant, so to speak, and it's super flexible. Going inside, you can see the connectors of choice that I use, which are full circle ring connectors. I do not like four connectors for this application. Once again, safety. You can have a loose terminal, and you never have to worry about them pulling out. These are a joke, okay? They just screw right in and you're good. Once again, soldering. You can see everything on this build is soldered. There is no no BS with this crimping crap. That's you you know you're not we're not a, once again assembling a car stereo. This is serious stuff. Take it serious. Again, our leads. You can see how our leads are all done. Same principle. And we know already green is ground. He can hook up the red, the black, or the white in any configuration he'd like for the remaining UV and W typically on your VFD because we already know that they're all power leads. So if you if you mix up black with white, guess what? It's a power lead. You make, mix up uh, white with red, it's a power lead. The only two you're concerned about are your grounds. You don't want to screw those up. Okay. Now, 
First ground is going to be, you can see the heavy gauge, the 16 gauge, will go to your, is actually going to your spindle plug, okay? Now, the secondary ground, which is out of silicone that I did on this cable, is actually the ground drain, okay? This is going to another ground terminal in your VFD's location. If you go and you look at your VFD, most of them will have multiple grounding points if you look carefully. A lot of guys don't take the time to look carefully enough, and you'll see they're on there. There's a little insignia for the ground on the left and right side. In a previous video I did where I was actually going over setting up a client's programming for a spindle, you could see it. I've discussed it. Okay, so I'll put that link to a video in the description as well so you guys can see it. But you can see how the end product turned out. Once again, real simple. This is a plug and play unit. He doesn't have to do much. Just put them in and you're basically good to go. Once again, I finished the assembly using heat shrink. Keep our wires nice and neat. You don't want to peel off too much. You know, you want to have just a nice cable. That's up to you as far as your length. Um, but overall, this cable, he'll never have any problems with. He's ready to go. Okay, so you guys now basically have an understanding of just how this process is. Is it tedious? Yes, it is. I've been doing these now full time in excess of seven years online. And I can tell you, working with these type of connectors every day, they never, ever, ever cease to surprise me. Okay, uh, what seems to be an easy process isn't always an easy process. So keep that in mind. Okay, if you're uncertain, don't get involved with this and try to assemble this half-assed and screw it up. I've had a lot of past potential clients as well as clients in general uh, try to solder things and not know what they're doing. And look, I look at it this way. You can be honest with yourself and lie to yourself. That's totally up to you. If you go to do it and you actually screw it up, I already know who I'm working with because I can see the work that's done. If you've taken the time and you say, hey, I'm honest with myself, this is what I can do, I'll know it. If not, it's like me pretending to do body work and taking it to, you know, uh, Boyd Coddington's shop and saying, here, look at this. Did I do a good job? He's going to know right away. Okay. So it is what, I, what it is. And we have to look at this in that perspective. You definitely want to take your time and understand what you're working with. If you don't, there's nothing wrong with that. You know, admit it to yourself and say, hey, you know what? This is above my pay grade. I would rather have someone do it that knows what they're doing. Um, most of you guys have friends that can solder. If you don't, contact me. This past client um, that the cable I just sent you actually, or excuse me, I showed you, I built two of them for him. He wanted twins, okay, um, for that specific reason, okay? A lot of manufacturers are telling people that the cables that come with their machines don't need to be shielded. Matter of fact, that's what this client told me. Um, as he purchased these, he said, I know what you're saying is true. Um, I've seen it. And personally, I think it's, it's wrong that they're saying that. And you know what, guys, that is. A lot of OEM manufacturers that are hitting the market now that you see more and more of are releasing this equipment without properly shielded cables. And the reason they are is because it hits their bottom line. They're not cheap. And it takes a lot of man hours to do. You know, I mean, you have to think about that. You have to think about what you're purchasing. If you're saving money somewhere, are you saving money in the cost of quality and performance? That's the thing you need to think of because see, CNCs, they either are stable or they're not. There is no in-between because a machine that works semi-good is unstable and you never know when it's going to bite you. Take your time and realize what you're working with. If your system you're purchasing does not come with double shielded and shielded cables utilized throughout, you do not want it because you're going to at one point or another most likely have to retrofit. I'm not saying 100% of the systems require it because I get told that a lot too. Well, I don't have shielded cables and I'm fine. Great. 98% will need shielded cables. Okay. Why take a chance? Okay. Don't worry so much about the gauge of the wire. I get asked that all the time. They think they're overbuilding when they select larger gauge uh, cable. That's not a big deal. What is a big deal is the shielding and the quality of the cable you're using to protect those precious signals that we're working with. Okay, so just keep that in mind. That is the imperative side to it. I hope this video has been helpful. Again, I know it's probably going to raise some more questions, which I'm more than willing to answer. Um, once again, I am very busy. If you guys have any questions, please direct them to storm2313 at gmail.com, which is my direct email. And you can also go to my eDealer Direct store, message me there, and I'll do my best to get back to you as soon as possible. Please understand that the busier I get, my <laughs> I'm trying my best to get all the emails answered and all the questions answered daily.
if it does run over, I'm not being disrespectful. I'm just really busy, okay? I will definitely get back to you. Um, again, I will put the link to the video showing the actual spindle cable uh, hooked up just to give you guys an idea and you'll see exactly, like I said, those ground locations on the VFD. And if you guys have an original VFD or something that's out of the ordinary, which happens all the time, let me know. Nine out of ten times we'll figure out a solution and we'll get you guys set up. Thank you all again, and to my subscribers, once again, I love you guys. Um, I'm going to keep the knowledge base growing. Got a lot of things going on in the future that I think you guys are going to enjoy. Um, once again, thank you all for listening. Take care.